And I'll turn it over to our fearless DCIS leaders to start the introductions. As soon as they unmute, they will start the introductions. Uh, taught enough classes, you would think I, I knew that trick by now. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Gert. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our attendees this evening. My name is Jeremy Firavati. I am the president of the Delaware County Institute of Science, DCIS, uh, and I'm a biology professor with Harrisburg Area Community College, known as HAT. I'd like to welcome you to our second virtual winter lecture webinar for this season. Um, this is no small feat for an organization that's all volunteer that was founded in 1833 and now resides in a old building uh, in the heart of downtown media, Pennsylvania, that was built in 1867. I'd like to encourage all of our attendees to support the Institute in any manner possible by promoting our presence on the web, donations, volunteerism, et cetera. If you are in the area, please come out and say hello to us. We are open on Thursday mornings, and we are now uh, going to start to open one Saturday a month. So keep your your eyes peeled for that. I'd like to thank Dr. Laura Gerton of Penn State for hosting the webinar as well as the video maintenance of the lecture and our vice president, uh, Dr. Anthony Lombardo of Rose Tree Media retired for a technical support, particularly in-person um, lecture a component. Um, so uh, basically without further ado, I just want to say a few things about our speaker and then welcome him and let him get started on the lecture. Um, Adam Graham Squire, a PhD, is an associate professor of mathematics at High Point University in High Point, North Carolina. His research focuses on mathematics related to democracy, particularly ranked choice voting and gerrymandering. While Adam is interested in both theoretical and empirical research, <clears throat> most of his recent research has involved looking for voting anomalies in real world, instant runoff, and single transferable vote elections. So very topical and interesting topic for this evening. Our lecturer was kind enough to respond to uh, a math listserv uh, request. He is published and uh, he has family on the West Coast in the Seattle area. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Adam Graham Squire to present his work. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, I would like to start by just saying thank you to the, uh, the organizers of this. I, um, really enjoy talking about, uh, voting theory and ranked choice voting, and, um, I'm really looking forward to the, the talk tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone who, who has showed up to hear this. So, um, I'm going to be talking about, um, my personal perspective, that is a mathematician's perspective on ranked choice voting. And um, there are many approaches to this. You can look at it from a political science lens. There's a lot of economists who are involved in, in looking at research in this area. Um, so the, the way I approach it is, is very much from a mathematical perspective. But, um, you know, at the end, when there are time for questions, I'm, I'm happy to field whatever. I, I've spent a lot of time um, in this area in a lot of different topics. So um, I can't speak on all of them as a authority, but... Um, I can speak on a lot of them. So um, let's get to it. So the first question is, what is ranked choice voting? And in most American elections these days, when you go, and in most places, when you go to vote, you only vote for one person. Even if there are three or four or five people on the ballot, um, you just mark your, your tally for one person. And there are often other parties, other than just the Democrats and Republicans, on the ballot, um, but if for the most part, in most places, if you're voting for a libertarian or a green candidate, you might be adding to three to 4% of the overall vote. And that vote basically just gets thrown away if you're not voting for one of the, the major candidates, again, often a Democrat or Republican. So our jumping off point for thinking about ranked choice voting and the, the general area is called voting theory that I, I work in, is what if instead of just voting for one person, you could vote for multiple candidates and actually rank those candidates? This is what ranked choice voting is, it's in the name. 
So all the candidates are on the ballot at the same time, and a voter would rank all of those candidates instead of just listing their top choice. And you can imagine that having all of the rankings would give us more information about who voters prefer. And theoretically, um, we could make a more democratic, a better decision about who the winner should be if we had all that data. Um, a quick note keeping comment though, if you are aware of been following this at all in the US or if you happen to have uh, some kind of voting method like this in your area, in the US what people refer to as ranked choice voting is actually what a voting, voting theorist would call instant runoff voting. So to me, a ranked choice election method is any method that involves ranking your choices. The most prominent one in the US is, is something called instant runoff. So um, you'll, you'll hear me talk about instant runoff. It might be that you've always thought of that as just ranked choice voting. So what does it look like? So suppose you have four candidates in an election and I'll label them A, B, C, and D. Then um, a sample ballot could look like this here where you're basically just listing off your first, second, third, and fourth choices, um, B being the first, D being the second, et cetera. All of those ballots from each voter would then get tabulated into what's called a preference schedule. Um, so here, you know, this first column means that 70 people voted A, B, C, D. And these numbers up here in, in pretty much all the elections we'll look at today, um, I make the numbers add up to 100. So you can think of these as percentages or you can think of them as, you know, 100 voters. Um, so 70 voters voted A first, B second, then C, then D. 13 voted B, C, D, A, et cetera. And the, again, the technical name for this is a preference schedule. I usually just refer to it as an election because that's what it is. This is the data um, that you would have in an election. So I'm going to pause for just a second and give you a moment to look at this data and think to yourself, if you had an election where you had this data here with that many people voting for those rankings, who would you choose as the winner of the election? So I'll give you a second to think about that and then I'll tell you what I think. <clears throat> so the, the big number here is the 70. So if you have 70 out of 100 people all voting a certain way, that's a majority, that's greater than 50%. And all 70 of those people listed A as their top choice. So the sort of obvious best choice here would be candidate A. I mean, it's possible you can make an argument for B because... They don't have that many people who rank them last, but really A is kind of the obvious best choice. But not all the data sets are quite this simple. So suppose we had this preference schedule, this election. Uh, take a moment and maybe think about who you think should be the winner of this election. And then again, I'll give you a moment to make your own decision and then, then I'll tell you what the right answer is. So what makes this election a little bit more complicated is we don't have an obvious winner. If you look at these first place votes, every candidate gets some, but no one gets greater than 50%. No one has an outright majority. Um, A has the most first place votes. We would call that the plurality. But they also have a whole lot of people that really don't like them, uh, that list them as their fourth choice. So... A, even though they have the most first place votes, would probably not be a good uh, decision. And then B, C, and D, B has the most first place votes of those three. And they've also got a lot of second place votes. So they seem like they might be a good choice. Um, most people, I think, would look at this and think that, that B would be the, the best choice as the winner of this election. And how about an even much, much more complicated example? Um, this one comes from an actual uh, real world election. So uh, these are the percentages of the, the votes that happened. And uh, there are three candidates, which I labeled as B, PA, and PE for reasons that will become clear in a moment. Um, before we do that though, 
we're going to do the same trick for this election. And I want you to look at what that vote data tells you and, and who you think should be the, the winner. So I did some of the math for you um, to help you out. If you add up all of these ballots where B is in first place, that adds up to 28.6. PA has 31.3 percentage points of the first place vote. And PE has 40.2. Um, and another fun thing to note is that if you ignore one of the candidates, so suppose we ignored um, candidate PE for a moment, and we just looked at and compared B and PA. So that would be in this column 8.2, we'd be ignoring the PE. Um, similarly over here, we'd just be looking at whether B is on top or PA is on top. You can effectively compare those two in a head-to-head -head matchup. And when you do that, B ends up beating PA, B also ends up beating PE, and PE beats PA. So now that you have that information and you can look at all the data, once again, take a moment and think to yourself who you think uh, should be the winner of this election. So this one is a bit more complicated. For example, PE gets 40.2% of the first place vote. So that's pretty good, but it's not a majority. It's really not anywhere close to 50%. Um, but it's it's better than the other two. So from that perspective, you might think that PE should be the winner. And in fact, there are a lot of places in the US where if you had an election like this, a candidate winning greater than 40% of the, the overall vote would not go to a runoff election. They would just win outright. Um, on the other hand, when we look at the ranked data, we get a little bit more information and we can tell that this candidate B, who had the least amount of first place votes, they actually beat both of the other candidates in a head-to-head -head matchup. So if you're beating everyone else in a head-to-head -head matchup, maybe you should be the winner. Um, so we've got sort of contrasting views of what it would mean to be the winner of an election. And that leads us to maybe thinking, instead of just glancing at the data and you know making up fun stories, maybe we should have a systematic way to find a winner. And what we're going to do now is dive into what some of those would look like. And these are some different voting methods. So the first one is plurality. And um, a plurality election is just basically the way we do most elections now. All you do is look at the first place votes and you ignore all of the other ranked data. And if you do that, PE wins because um, PE has over 40%, which is more than anyone else of the first place vote. So they would win that one. Um, another method is instant runoff. And this is actually the method that was used for this election, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. The way instant runoff works is if in that first round, when you look at those first place votes, no one has a majority, which is what we have in this situation, you then find the candidate with the lowest number of first place votes and you eliminate them from all of the ballots. And then the ballots where they were listed first are then allocated to whoever was listed in second place. And you then um, retally all of the first place votes um, and see if anybody has a majority. If not, you repeat the process. So in this case, remember candidate B, they had the lowest number of first place votes. So we would eliminate them. So they get crossed off of all of these ballots here. The 14.4% column, those B voters now go to PA. And in the 8.2 column, those B votes would now go to PE. And in the 6.0 column, those B voters didn't rank anyone else. And this is actually pretty common in real world elections. Voters will just vote for one candidate. So those ballots would just disappear when we go to the next round. They would not, um, they would not move on. So when you add 14.4 to PA's votes and 8.2 to PE, um, PA ends up getting about six percentage points more but remember, they were already about nine percentage points behind. So uh, when those that's retallied, um, PE and PA go up head to head against each other. 
and PE ends up beating PA in that head-to-head -head matchup and PE wins. Um, and then our last method on this page is pairwise comparison. This is kind of like doing a round robin competition between all the candidates where you look at all the head-to-head -head matchups. Um, and we saw that data here and B ends up winning both of the, beating the other two candidates in a head-to-head. -head. So B would win what we would call the pairwise comparison. Um, so PE is winning two methods, B is winning another one. And um, in the actual election, uh, IRV was the method used. And this was actually the first time IRV was used in the state of Alaska. And this was the August uh, 2022 special election for a House seat. Uh, the B stands for Nick Begich, PA is Sarah Palin, and PE is Mary Peltola. And notice that uh, Begich and Palin are um, both Republicans, um, and Peltola was a Democrat, and Peltola did end up winning uh, that seat. So before we talk more about that, um, let's talk about one other ranked choice voting method. And this is this is the, the method that if you start telling people about ranked choice voting, this is often the one they come up with on their own. It's called Borda Count, and Borda was a, a mathematician who was one of the first people to sort of come up with this system and, and publicize it. But it's basically just a point system. Every time you're ranked first, you get two points. Every time you're ranked second, you get one point. For a last place, you get no points. So Begich is ranked first in these three columns. So we take those three columns, add them together, multiply by two. And then the 18.1, that's where Begich is listed second. And the 25.1 is also where Begich is listed second. And when you add all that up, Begich ends up getting 100.4 points. And that's more than either Palin or Peltola. So Begich would win uh, the board account as well. And I should mention, there are a lot of other voting methods. In particular, with board account, you know, there are different ways to allocate the points. Some people would say, oh, you give three points for first place, and then one point, and then zero. Other people would say, you know, it's not fair if this column, there's no one listed in, you know, second and third place, so you would allocate extra points to Peltola and Palin because those spots are missing. And pretty much any way you do it for board account, um, Begich is, is going to be the winner. Um, and then there's other voting methods. The Coombs method is like instant runoff, but you eliminate the person with the most last place votes. The Buckland method, you look at first place votes. If no one has a majority, then you add in all of their second place votes. And then there are other methods that don't involve ranking at all. These would not actually be ranked choice voting methods, but they're voting methods that you would use if you have multiple candidates. So approval voting, what happens is you're given the list of candidates. Here, we would be given Begich, Palin, and Peltola. And instead of ranking them, you would just say whether or not you approve of them. And you could approve of one candidate. You could approve of two candidates. So some people, you know, who are voting, you know, B and then PA in this first column, they might approve of both Begich and Palin, or some of them might just approve of Begich. In any case, you take all those approvals, you add them all up. Whichever candidate gets the most approvals wins the election. Range vote is similar to approval voting, but instead of just saying approve or disapprove, you're actually giving each candidate a score, maybe from zero to 10. Um, it's kind of like Yelp, except for voting. And you give each of the candidates scores. So it's another way of thinking of it. It's like board account, but instead of just giving a precise number, two and one, you could maybe give 10 points and then three points and then zero points. Um, and then once everybody gives their scores, you add up all those points. Whoever has the most points wins the election. Um, so which of these methods are actually used for political elections? Well, plurality is far and away the most widely used uh, in the United States. Oftentimes, if no candidate wins a majority in a plurality election, we go to a runoff election, and we would call that a top two runoff. Um, Instant runoff is different from a top two runoff because with instant runoff, you're ranking all of the, the candidates. Generally, with the top two runoff, um, you're actually having two separate elections. Um, and one of the reasons that people like instant runoff is that 
you don't have to have people coming back for a second election. Everybody just has to come and vote at one time. So people argue it could improve turnout um, for elections. Um, I don't know if there's any data to support that, but I've heard people say that. Instant runoff is a more, it's kind of an up and coming method. Uh, in the last 20 years or so, the number of places that have been using it has been increasing steadily. Um, initially, it was mainly in the Bay Area. So San Francisco and Oakland and Alameda County were sort of uh, some of the earliest adopters. Minneapolis as well was an early adopter. And then New York City and Maine and Alaska, those have all been in the last, you know, four, three or four years um, that they've adopted and started using instant runoff. Some just for local elections for Maine and Alaska, they use it to elect um, senators and representatives um, as well. Uh, approval voting um, has been used in just a couple of places that I know of in the U.S. Uh, both Fargo and St. Louis have done it. And I think a total of three elections so far that they've they've used approval voting. So I think there's still, you know, an open question as to how how well that works, because um, that's still pretty rare. Um, and then something like a board account or pairwise comparison or range voting. As far as I know, those have not been used for political elections anywhere. Um, they're just theoretical methods at this point. And then there's a whole lot of other ranked choice methods that are used outside of the US for multi-member elections. Um, for more of like a single vote method, there's parliamentary systems where you actually take the votes and you then divvy up your, your parliament based on who gets what vote. Single transferable vote is a ranked voting method. It's similar to instant runoff, but instead of just electing one candidate, you're electing multiple candidates, maybe um, three or four to say a, a city council or something like that. Um, I've done a, a fair amount of research with a uh, single transferable vote in Scotland. And I know Portland, Oregon just recently uh, passed a measure that they're going to use a version of STV to elect their city council. Um, so it is again, becoming more, more popular in the US. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, the, the data we've been using to show the ranked choice elections has been in form of a preference schedule, but that's not actually a useful way of portraying the data um, if you have a real world election because there's often so many different types of ballots that there's no way to show it easily. So oftentimes the data is showed in what's called a vote by rounds table. So this is the data as it was displayed from the New York City 2021 mayoral election. Uh, so Eric Adams, had the, you know, 31% in the first round and you get similar numbers for the other candidates. And then as you go into each round, as you're eliminating candidates, uh, other candidates start increasing their percentages. So here in at the end of round five, both Stringer and Morales are eliminated and their votes go to, some go to Yang, some go to Wiley, some to Garcia and some to Eric Adams. Yang is eliminated and then Wiley is eliminated. Adams ends up beating Garcia just barely uh, in that final round. And notice that um, these numbers are always adding up to 100 or close to it. Um, and that's because these are percentages of the remaining ballots. But in fact, not all ballots go on to the next round. Some do get, you know, um, just tossed out if they don't have a full ranking on them. So here's another way of displaying this data. This is round six and we had the four candidates left. Yang was eliminated, and then it sort of uses these octopus legs to show where Yang's votes go. Um, Wiley is eliminated and a similar thing, and then you can compare Eric Adams and Catherine Garcia there. But notice that there's all these inactive ballots down here. So although Eric Adams won a majority of the remaining vote, he did not actually win a majority of the original vote in that election. Um, and that's something we'll talk about uh, later. That's a you know an, an issue sometimes with instant runoff. Um, so what? How do people feel about RCV? Well, after that uh, instant runoff election in Alaska, which again was the first IRV election in uh, Alaskan history, um, Sarah Palin, the loser, called IRV crazy, convoluted, and confusing. Um, 
Senator Tom Cotton said that ranked choice voting is a scam to rig elections. Um, so is IRV a scam? Uh, the answer to that is no. But it turns out there are some weird things that can happen with ranked choice voting. And I think Sarah Palin and Tom Cotton were mainly angry that Sarah Palin lost the election. Um, but there are actually some some real concerns about instant runoff elections and, and ranked choice voting in, in general. So um, we're going to focus now on some of those anomalies that can happen. And this is actually the meat of where my research area is. One of the main things that I do is look for these kind of strange voting anomalies in real world elections. So the first um, anomaly that we're going to talk about is what's called a monotonicity anomaly. And generally speaking, when you go to vote, if you were doing a ranked choice vote, you would assume that if you rank a candidate higher on your ballot, that would help them. Um, and we're going to look at this election that we looked at before the Alaska election. And this column where we had eight, or sorry, we have the people that just voted for Palin. This original number in the original election was actually, uh, I think it was 11.3. So we're going to do a little modification. We're going to suppose that 2.8% of those Palin voters, and again, let me go back to the original election here. It was 11.3. So we're taking 2.8% away from that. Palin now only has 8.5% left. And suppose those voters on their way to the voting booth decided that actually Sarah Palin wasn't their favorite choice and really they should vote for the Democrat, Mary Peltola. Again, this is a bit far-fetched, but let's suppose they did that. Then Peltola's numbers, where it was Peltola first and then Palin second, those would increase by 2.8 percentage points. So that would now give her 5.3. So after that happens, when you then tally all the numbers, Palin has now dropped in her first place votes to the point where she is now below Nick Begich. So Palin would be eliminated. And when we cross her off the ballot, most of her votes go to Begich. And in the second round, Begich ends up getting more votes than Peltola. So Begich wins the election. So what happened here is because 2.8% of the voters raised up Peltola in some ballots, that actually made Peltola lose the election. So this is what's called an upward monotonicity anomaly. And it's upward because you're raising a candidate up on some uh, ballots, and it's an anomaly because that ends up making that candidate lose. So you're expecting things to go in the same direction. You raise their ranking, and that should raise them higher in the election, or at least not make them lose. And in fact, the opposite thing happens. So that's a little disconcerting. You don't want to raise your ranking of a candidate and have that make them lose. Um, and we've got some other things too. So generally speaking, we tell people that you should show up to vote and that voting is important. It's, it's a good thing to actually go and vote. Um, but in a similar vein, suppose that 2.8 percentage points of these voters who voted P-A-B-P-E, so that's the 15.3 column here, that was originally in 18.1, but 2.8% of those voters, 2.8 percentage points of those, they don't show up. They were on their way to vote and they decided instead they were going to go to the movies and skip voting because whatever, it's Alaska and that's what they do. Um, so they don't show up to vote. Once again, that lowers Palin's first place vote numbers. She now drops out before Nick Begich. And when Palin drops out, she gives most of her votes to Begich. And once again, Begich wins 43.9 to 42.1. So why is this a problem? Well, look at these voters. When they show up to vote, their third place candidate, Peltola, wins the election. But when they don't show up to vote, their second place candidate, Nick Begich, ends up winning the election. So they are actually better off if they don't show up to vote because when they don't show up to vote, they get their second choice instead of their last choice. Um, this is called a no-show anomaly. Um, the idea being it's an anomaly because by not showing up, those people benefited. So that sounds pretty bad for instant runoff. 
Um, but it turns out that all of the RCV election methods that we've seen so far have some issues. Um, and these are these issues, the monotonicity anomaly and the no-show anomaly. The general term we use for that is a fairness criteria. So these are criteria that you would want in a fair election. That is, if you raise someone higher in their in a ballot, you want that to help them, not hurt them. Um, in a fair election, you would also want it to help people if their supporters showed up to vote for them. Um, so instant runoff violates uh, some of those. Similarly, pairwise comparison, an issue with that is it does not always elect a winner. So there was an instant runoff election in Minneapolis in 2021, and it was an instant runoff election, but we can analyze the data as if it was pairwise comparison. And in that election, in the head-to-heads, uh, a candidate named Arab beat Gordon, Gordon beat Werleba, and Werleba beat Arab. There was a cycle um, between those three candidates, and all three of them beat two other weaker candidates. So if you look at their pairwise comparison, they all won three elections, so it would be a three-way tie. Um, so that's not good. If you have a voting method, you want it to actually choose a winner, not, not give you a tie. Um, board account, <clears throat> the point system sounds great, um, but it fails something called the majority criterion. The majority criterion says if you get a majority of first place votes, then you should win the election. And again, that sounds pretty fair because that's how we run all of our elections right now. But it turns out with a board account, you can have someone who gets a majority of first place votes, maybe 51%, but all the other people really hate them. And then there's someone else who's ranked second in a lot of those ballots, and that person can actually get more points. So you can have someone who has a majority of first place votes, majority support, who could end up losing a board account election. And again, we kind of think that that would be a bad thing. Um, we already saw the example where IRV failing monotonicity, it also fails no-show, and it also fails something called the majoritarian criteria. This sounds like majority, and it is similar, but not quite. The idea here is that we would ideally want our majority winner to be the have a majority of the original votes, but in instant runoff, you only get a majority of the remaining votes. And as we saw in the New York City election, and also in the Alaska election, the person who ended up winning that election did not actually have a majority of the original votes. They just had a majority of the remaining votes. And then plurality, the method that we use now, has some major issues with uh, what's called the spoiler effect. Um, and that is that if you have a third party candidate entering the election, they can pull votes from one of the candidates and make both of those candidates lose. Um, Ralph Nader uh, in the 2000 election was accused of this, that that he pulled votes from Al Gore, and that ended up being what caused Al Gore to lose Florida and thus the presidential election. That can be debated because we don't actually have the ranked data to show um, that those Nader voters would have voted for Gore. It's, we don't know for certain, um, but it's, it's quite believable. And that spoiler effect issue is one of the main reasons that we don't have a lot of third parties uh, in the US or strong third parties. It's because when that third party comes in, they end up hurting um, the, the party they're closest to. So what can we conclude? Uh, well, it kind of looks like none of these ranked choice methods are great. So we just need to find another one, right? So we talked about the Coons method, Buckland, there's the approval method, um, range voting. Maybe we just need a good one. And that's the one we should use for our ranked choice uh, voting. And it turns out that that's not possible. So um, for a long time, voting theorists tried to do that. They looked at different voting methods and tried to figure out which one was the best. And um, then Kenneth Arrow, a mathematician, created what's called Arrow's impossibility theorem, where he proved that, and I'm paraphrasing here, that for elections with three or more candidates and any number of voters, there is no ranked choice voting method that will satisfy all fairness criteria. That is, there's something about the different fairness criteria where they're inherently in conflict with one another. If you are guaranteed to have two of the fairness criteria, that will mean that there's going to be certain situations when you're going to fail a third one. And that's going to be true for any voting method. Um, so there is no perfect voting method. 
So democracy's dead and we should all go home. Thanks. Just kidding. That's a little, a little voting theory joke for you. Um, there is in fact hope and um, it sounds pretty bad to say there is no, you know, every every voting method has flaws, but I think there's a lot of things you can then do with that uh, to ask yourself, you know, what do we really want to do with our democracy? So the first thing that that struck me was we know that voting methods can violate these criteria, that we can have these anomalies. But a more important question is how often do these anomalies show up? Because I can make up some election where I can cause an anomaly, but does that actually happen very often in a real world election? So uh, with my colleague, um, Dave McCune, we looked at all of the instant runoff elections that have occurred in the US that we could get data for. Um, that was somewhere around four or 500 elections um, and about 200 or so of those elections were actually close in the sense that they went to a second uh, round. So in a lot of instant runoff elections, you have someone who wins in the first round or it's, you know, you, maybe you just have one person running. In those cases, there aren't going to be any anomalies. So out of the interesting elections that were actually close, uh, these were the frequency that we found for the different anomalies. About a half a percent were no-show anomalies. And I think the Alaska election might be the only one that we found. A Condorcet winner anomaly um, a Condorcet winner is a candidate that beats all the other candidates in a head-to-head. -head. And like we said with Nick Begich, you would expect that person to be the winner of the election. So when they are not the winner, we call that a Condorcet winner anomaly. We found that in 1% approximately of the elections. And again, uh, I think that totaled just two elections, one of which was that Alaska election that we just seen. Uh, upward monotonicity anomalies, that showed up 2% of the time. And there's also... Um, downward anomalies. So this is when you take a losing candidate, you move them down in some ballots, and that somehow makes them become the winner of the election. Uh, that showed up one and a half percentage points of the time. A compromise anomaly um, is a situation where if you knew ahead of time what the data was going to look like for the election, you could maybe strategically vote in a certain way and get a better result for yourself. So uh, the example we have from the Alaska election is all of the voters that voted for Palin first, Begich second, and then Peltola. If some of those voters would have just put Begich as their first choice instead, Palin would have dropped out in the first round and then Begich would have won. So had they compromised and taken their actual second place candidate and put, put them first, then they would have gotten a better result. They would have gotten their second choice instead of their third choice. Um, and that happens about 5% of the time, where if you if you knew just the right compromise to do, you could do that and potentially get a better result. And then the majoritarian um, anomalies, that one showed up a whole lot. So in over half of the instant runoff elections we looked at, the winner did not have greater than 50% of the original vote. Um, and again, that looks kind of bad, but... Um, the thing to realize about that is that the majoritarian anomalies are partially having to do with the voting method, instant runoff, but they also have to do with the fact that a lot of voters don't rank all the candidates. So if all of your ballots were fully ranked, then you wouldn't have a majoritarian anomaly. Um, so this, this has more to do with the voters than it does with the method, one could say. So that's one thing to notice is, hey, these weird anomalies that look really terrible they don't actually happen that much. Or maybe you look at 2% and you think that's insane that it's that high. I would never want a voting method like that. Uh, that's a, a fair interpretation. Um, another thing to think about is that no voting method is perfect. Thank you, Kenneth Arrow. So now that we know that, we can look at the election methods that we have and think about what they do and how they work and um, the way they do democracy is different. And so what do we want our democracy to be? Um, that's an important discussion to have. And then we pick the method that does that. So for example, the plurality method, well, which we have now, tends to encourage a two-party system, like I talked about before, um, whereas something like instant runoff could encourage more parties. And the reason is that in an instant runoff election, you can vote for a third-party candidate 
And if they don't get many votes and then they drop out, your vote still gets reallocated to a Democrat or Republican, one of the more major party candidates. So um, in, I think, Burlington, Vermont um, was an early adopter of instant runoff, and they had a mayoral election in 2009 where a progressive candidate beat the Democrat and the Republican um, because of instant runoff voting. You could actually have such a candidate in the election you weren't just locking down into Democrat and Republican. Um, so that's one of the reasons that a lot of people like IRV and why it's gotten support in a lot of places is because people think it could encourage more parties and that that might break the two party system that we have in the, or at least start to break that system in the United States. Another thing to think about is that Arrow's method, Arrow's theorem, sorry, only applies to ranked choice voting methods. It doesn't apply to things like approval or range because those methods don't actually use ranking. You're just approving or you're giving a score. You're not actually doing a ranking. Um, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of people really like approval voting. There are a lot of voting theorists who would tell you that approval is the, the best voting method. Personally, I don't know that there's enough evidence out there, real world evidence to say that for certain. And there are issues with those voting methods, even though they don't fall into the normal fairness criteria the way we've seen before, they do have some issues with um, what I would call insincere voting. Um, so that would be something like if you're doing an approval vote and maybe you live in a city that you know is, you know, 60% Democrat and 40% Republican, if you're a Democrat, you might approve of two Democrat candidates, but you wouldn't necessarily vote for both of them because you might think, well, one of them is really my favorite one and the other one I kind of like, but don't like them as much. So I don't want to give the weaker candidate an approval and possibly make that be the approval that makes them win the election over my more preferred candidate. So even though you approve of both of them, you might only vote for one of them. And you get into some sort of gamesmanship there that um, can lead to some really bad results. Um, and approval and range, I think, are more susceptible to that than some of the other methods. Um, and then the last thing is that maybe voters don't actually care about these anomalies at all. So that Alaska election that we looked at that had all those anomalies and you had different winners using different methods, um, that was public knowledge in you know August, September, October, November of uh 2022 and in november of that year three months after the august election they had another election with the same candidates it was basically a rematch and did the voters actually change their minds and say oh look at all these anomalies we should elect nick begich they're the one that you know nick begich is the one who beat everyone else in a head-to-head -head. the answer no this is the data from the August 2022 election and the November 2022 election. And you can see in most of the columns that the data looks pretty similar. Um, the big difference is that Peltola ended up getting a lot more votes in the first round. She almost got a majority in the first round. And then when Begich drops out, um, there's enough votes that Peltola uh, gets pushed over to the top. Peltola wins 52.1% to 42.6%. So it was a even bigger win for Peltola. There were no voting anomalies. If you look at all the different voting methods, um, plurality, instant runoff, pairwise comparison, Borda, um, Peltola wins all of them. So clearly the voters think Peltola is best and they didn't seem bothered by the anomalies or the potential for, for compromise votes or anything like that. Um, so maybe maybe these anomalies that I'm talking about really don't matter because they don't seem to matter to to the voters. Um, and I think that's where I'm going to uh, end my talk and um, I'll go ahead and take any questions. I believe if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and um, they'll be read off and, and I can answer them. Very you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. If you can hear me, this is Anthony Lombardo from the Delaware County Institute of Science. Uh, 
Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful <laughs> display of a variety of voting methods. And uh, I think it's uh, quite extraordinary to see what, what actually goes on behind the scenes. If you have a particular question or any particular uh, uh, thing you'd like to state over here, please type it into your chat section at this time and we'll be able to display or at least uh, be able to read them to our host and try to provide you with an answer that way. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of a time. Uh, Dr. Graham, there's no question. Uh, first of all, can you, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, no question that, that the complexities here are quite overwhelming, especially for the layperson to hear that this has been going on behind the scenes of uh, the analysis of, of so many variations of, of uh, uh, voting, shall we say, procedures and all. Um, can you shed some light on the inner circle of people? How do they go about or the motives by which that they would even select a particular method, considering, as you mentioned, the anomalies? But uh, I guess to say um, this is sort of the information that would, dare I say, confuse most people. And when they become confused of statistical analysis or manipulations, and they just begin to get saturated with all the variations, um, that also itself has a political impact of, mm -hmm. shall we say, the, the distrust factor <laughs> when something that cannot be understood. So when you give, should I say, uh, counsel uh, to these and say, what is an appropriate method to use, considering all its, if it's positives and negatives, how do you how do you even entertain that sort of uh, question from people? Well, I mean, and this is one of the biggest, uh, you know, complaints people have about instant runoff is that it's it's too complicated. Um, but I I don't actually think it's really that complicated in, in the following sense that it's, I think most people understand ranking candidates um, that's relatively straightforward. And then um, this idea that it's really just like we normally do runoff elections. Um, so, you know, for example, in the, uh, what was it, the Georgia Senate elections in 2020 and in 2022, um, in both of those years, the there was no winner who had a majority in the first round, and then they went to a runoff election you know, five weeks later where everybody had to come out and vote again, we would, an instant runoff supporter would say, you know, instead of having two elections, you could have just ranked your candidates in that first round. And we would have had all the data to tell you exactly who the winner is going to be five weeks later. You wouldn't need to come back out and vote again. That's the benefit of instant runoff is um, you don't actually have to have multiple uh, rounds to the election. Um, and I, in the places where they've in like implemented it, um, it seems like when they when they poll the voters, voters don't actually seem to think it's it's really all that complicated. Um, and if you, uh, the thing is that you can always just go and vote for one person, just like you did before. Um, so if you're, if it's, if it's complicated to vote for multiple people, you just go in that vote for that one person, you're not optimizing your vote, but you're not actually making it uh, all that different. Um, one interesting, um, research area that I don't know that anyone's done, but I'd be interested to know is in, in the years following the implementation of this, of instant runoff, do you actually get a higher percentage of people voting, um, or ranking more people in the ballots? Because you would you would think that as people understood the method more, they would then want to rank more candidates. But as we saw from Alaska, that didn't happen. Um, in fact, it seemed like between August 2022 and November 2022, a whole lot more people just voted for one candidate um, in, in, instead of giving more rankings. Um, but I, I don't know what the, the full data would look like on that. Thank you. I have a question here that uh, do exit polls ever ask voters for rank choices so that even if the actual election 
is standard polar, uh, polarity, I mean, uh, right. polarity, mm -hmm. polarity uh, approach, uh, we can now uh, know how it would have resulted if the IRV was used. So in um, in some places where they, they have implemented instant runoff voting, now they are starting to do polls where they ask for your first, second, third choices. So we're starting to get that kind of polling data. For the most right. part, though, I don't think so. Um, I know before this, so one of the interesting things about the, the research that I, I've been doing is that there have been instant runoff elections before this, but um, they often didn't release their data. So one of the great things about San Francisco and Alaska and Oakland and all these places that have implemented this is that they've been making their data completely freely available. Um, so I can actually go take their data, put it into a computer, and I can check and see that they actually allocated the votes correctly. Um, so it's it's a nice thing to be able to do that. Um, and before we had that data, people would do exactly what that, that question is saying, where they would try to get poll data to figure out how voters would have ranked the candidates and then try to construct, you know, maybe an anomaly could have happened. Um, but until we had this kind of data, we never really knew for sure. Certainly. Another question was very similar to mine is putting forth. Uh, so I'm thinking about uh, the ability of most people to comprehend systems like this. And if you envision if there were challenges uh, to that analysis, as you were just mentioning, even upon review that was demonstrated in the 20, uh, 2000 elections. Um, so subject to the analysis of saying, well, the data show uh, as or it's validated that way. Uh, I, once again, I would imagine there's still a bit of the politics that still can enter in. You know, there's no objectivity in politics, as it were. Yeah. Uh, would that subject the uh, to those who would actually approve these uh, to to what is validity? I think when it comes down to and how is it defined in these environments? Yeah, um, I mean, it's interesting because there's because the data is released, you can actually, you know, if if you have the programming. Uh, ability, you can actually check and see that the elections were done correctly and the votes allocated the correct way. And they, you, if you go to the Alaska, you know, Board of Elections website, they show here's all the first place votes and here's where the votes got allocated. And so you can actually see it all, which theoretically would be a good thing. Um, but yeah, it's very politicized. And, and currently, it tends to be Democrats who are in favor of um, making you know, attempting new voting systems and Republicans that are opposed um, with some caveats. I mean, Alaska decided to do instant runoff and Alaska, last time I checked, not a very Democrat state overall. Um, Utah also does instant runoff voting um, and a, they're a very Republican state. Uh, the Republican National, uh, or sorry, the Republican Party in Virginia for their most recent, they've been using instant runoff to choose who their uh, Republican candidates are going to be. And so in their most recent governor election, their instant runoff method chose Glenn Youngkin, who ended up winning the governorship in Virginia. Um, so I think it they're, they're even in the politicized areas, people are starting to see like, oh, this can actually give us a good result. Um, it is true that Getting a more democratic result is not necessarily what the political parties want, as they often want just their party to win. Um, so you you do see some opposition to it from from all ends of the spectrum. This does bring up an, another question. We'll take as the final question. Speaking of the uh, of this issue of the politics involved and gerrymandering becomes the. Uh, the subsequent method to all this, as you just kind of illustrated, can you speak on the jury mandering motivations there? So honestly, the it's really hard to know, um, you know, how this how this would affect gerrymandering. So um, the 
the in angle I'm most interested in is if you instituted a ranked choice voting method that did enable the growth of more parties, say you had three or four strong parties um, in the US, would that make gerrymandering a whole lot more difficult? Like right now, it's really easy to know where your Democrats and Republicans are, and you can draw really careful lines to prop out one party um, and pack another party. But if if you had to take care for what people's second choice votes were, if their party didn't win, uh, that might actually make the whole thing a whole lot more complicated to the point where gerrymandering would be much more difficult. Um, at this point, we don't really know. Um, but the the two issues right now are, I would say, fairly separate just because they're most of the elections where this is occurring are either at the local level, where you don't really have a gerrymandering issue, um, or at, you know, for statewide elections. I mean, in Alaska, there's just one House seat. In Maine, there's two House seats. So um, it's kind of unknown how the, the two would, would fit together. Of course, which leads us to, I will entertain one more question, if you don't mind. And this is quite simple. Who decides whether to implement an alternative uh, method to a one-to-one -one vote, a one-person vote? Is it a referendum or by legislature? How, the, how does this happen? I think it could go any direction. Um, you know, Seattle recently, I think I mentioned Portland, Oregon, they recently implemented instant runoff, I think, for their mayoral elections, and they've got a single transferable vote method for city council. In Seattle, they recently had a ballot uh, measure, and it was it was two parts. The first part was, do you want to change the voting system from our regular plurality, like one person vote system to a different option? And then the second part was, if we change it, do we want to change it to approval voting or to instant runoff voting? And uh, the vote to change it, I think just barely passed. It was just, just over 50%. But then in terms of which one did people prefer, approval voting or ranked choice voting, uh, that one solidly went in favor of ranked choice voting. I think it was something like 70% to 30%. Um, and, and the reason I heard from a lot of people, um, my relatives mainly, people I talked to, is that they liked the idea in ranked choice voting that you actually get to choose who your top choice is. You're not, you know, like you might approve of two people, but you still want to be able to differentiate between them. And they felt like they could do that with ranked choice voting. Um, so ideally, the people would choose. Um, that isn't always the case. I, and I know, I don't know if it actually happened, but I believe in North Dakota, the legislature was trying to ban approval voting. So Fargo had done it and the, the state legislature was trying to pass a law that said you're not allowed to do any municipal elections other than, you know, regular one person, one vote thing. Um, I don't know what their motivation was behind that other than some progressive people in this town are doing something and we don't want anything that they like. I, I don't actually know the philosophy behind it, but um, Ideally, that the people would choose, um, and and maybe they would choose something that that would serve our democracy better. Well, this is without question a very a fascinating, uh, and quite honestly, listening to this tonight, it, it it'll make my mind speculate on the inner workings of the voting procedure. I'd like to thank our uh, speaker tonight, Dr. Adam Graham Squire, for giving us uh, insights to this particular subject. And uh, I wish you well with your endeavors and clarifying all this for, <laughs> for America, if not democracy itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I thank you for coming to tonight's lecture. Uh, the next lectures that the Delaware County Institute of Science will be holding will be in person at the Institute, which is in Media, Pennsylvania, on March 11th. And uh, that will be by Dr. Lloyd Bastin on green chemistry, the promotion of green and sustainable practices in chemistry. Uh, we will begin on 730 at the Institute in person. Once again, I'd like to thank all of the attendees and in particular 
thank uh, Dr. Graham Squire uh, for the insights and this wonderful presentation this evening. We wish, wish you all the best. <laughs> and I'd like to say on behalf of everyone at the Institute, thank you for attending uh, this evening's uh, webinar. And uh, we look forward to the next opportunities. Thank you.